I'm going to talk today about the uh, role of that Lysenko played in the uh, Great Solomon Plan for the Transformation of Nature, which I believe is probably known to most people in the, in the room. Uh, uh, put short, it was a plan that began in 1948 to uh, change the climate of, uh, of Russia through the careful and selective planting of trees, which this slide here uh, depicts. So speaking in general terms, most evaluations of the Great Stalin Plan for the Transformation of Nature attribute a foundational ro role to Lysenko. Or put another way, most accounts blame Lysenko for concocting the grandiose scheme to remake the Russian climate by planting trees in certain patterns. For instance, David Jarofsky identified Lysenko as, beyond any doubt, the top specialist responsible for the Great Stalin Plan for the Transformation of Nature. Valerie Seufer described the entire episode as a flight of Lysenko's fancy. Uh, the authors in charge of the plan, as he puts it, were determined to follow Lysenko's prescriptions, and the very sound of Lysenko's name, he reports, brought to the Soviet citizens' mind a majestic panorama of vast fields of spreading wheat and green expanses of broad-leafed oaks, as well as birch, whose beauty for some reason until now was associated only with the North. A closer look at the Great Stalin Plan, however, shows that while Lysenko and his allies did indeed play an important role in the development and evolution of the plan, he was not its author. And in fact, its true designers mightily objected to Milosenko's interference. Indeed, the plan was, at its outset, a conservative and, con and conservationist enterprise dedicated to restoring the Russian countryside to an idealized but more diverse earlier state. Only later was it hijacked by Lysenko and his allies and transformed into high modernist fancy. At all times, but always behind the scenes, two factions struggled over the fate of the plan. On the one side, a group of what you might call technocrats, essentially conservative and well-grounded in ecological science. On the other, a group you might call adherents of Prometheanism, uh, those like Lysenko who believed that the arrival of the communist era had invalidated all natural limitations on human action. These uh, technocrats promoted afforestation work that acknowledged local variation and experimental results, while the Prometheans advanced the notion that plants could sacrifice themselves for the greater good of the community. As the plan unfolded, the technocrats slowly undermined the position of the Prometheans and succeeded in convincing party functionaries that Lysenko's ideas wrought poor results. But just as their arguments began to persuade those at the top of the party hierarchy, Stalin died and support for the plans died with him. The Great Stalin Plan ultimately reached few of its goals, but not because the Soviet state was held in the thrall of Lysenkoism from 1940 to 1953, at least in this field, but rather because Lysenkoism and technocracy canceled one another out. Although the Great Stalin Plan possessed no small air of fantasy about it, at its core lay an old and essentially conservative, if not reactionary, Russian dream to make the southern steppe more like old Muscovy. The first efforts to afforce the steppe date to the, to the mid-19th century, when the agronomist Viktor Yegorovich von Graf investigated which woody species were best suited to colonize the dry prairies of southern Russia. But this trend evolved further in 1892, when Tsar Alexander III appointed the influential soil scientist Vasily Dakochayev to determine the causes of the devastating drought the year before. Dakochayev concluded that human activity was to blame and argued that the steppes of Russia had been forested and hence climatically stable in the distant past, but through, after centuries of desultory agricultural development had become damaged. And Dakochayev urged the construction of forest belts throughout the south of Russia, uh, hoping to roll back the clock to a time when southern and central Russia were united under one canopy of trees. The careful application of science, that is soil, soil science, hydrology, geology, and dendrology working together would all be needed to make Dakochayev's dream real. But the result would be a restoration of Russian land more than a novel design or a redesign. Dakochayev's suggestions immediately seemed to strike a nerve in the 1890s. Perhaps Dakochayev reflected an awareness among educated Russians that most famously articulated by Kluchevsky that the history of Russia was the history of a struggle between the Russian forest and the Asiatic steppe. In his lectures, Kluchevsky described how the forest played a crucial role in Russian history, how it was for many centuries the basis of Russian life, and how the steppe intruded into this life only during harmful episodes, Tatar incursion, and Kazakh raids. Or perhaps Dakochayev simply offered a practical solution to the deeply embarrassing problem of recurring crop failures in southern Russia. Whatever the cause, the government adopted his recommendations, albeit on an extremely limited scale, establishing experimental forests in the steppe and promising ever more in the future. Afforestation, including steppe afforestation, only grew in importance after the revolution. Both Lenin and Stalin called for aggressive afforestation at party conferences in the 1920s, 
And as time went by, Stalin-era legislation creating protective areas and government agencies to oversee them encouraged ever more concerted and empirically based efforts. During the Civil War, forest ameliorative, ameliorative work all but came to a halt, but after Stalin's consolidation of power, in a 1931, created new, a 1931 law created new forest cultivation zones and instructed the People's Commissariat of Agriculture to battle drought by, creative, by creating protective belt stands on the territory of the state and collective farms, 40,000 hectares by 1932 and 350,000 hectares by 1936. The uh, Commissariat of Agriculture proved overmatched for the task, however, and the state chose to seek another solution. A main administration of forest protection and afforestation, or GLO, was created by Stalin's order in 1936. GLO's internal documentation reveals that the agency was able to achieve considerable success in its assigned tasks of afforesting the steppes. In the years before the war, the administration was establishing twice as much new forest per annum as did the Commissariat of Agriculture did uh, the year before. The survival rate for the more GLO claims steadily climbed, and this was assisted by the graduation of 1,400 students from the educational programs they had sponsored each year. Meanwhile, the mortality rate of the forest declined from, from 31% in 1936 to 25% in 1939, and then to 17% in 1940. If these numbers can be trusted, these are extremely good survival rates, I should say, uh, parenthetically. GLO attributed successes to increasingly educated cadres and also to improved ecologically-based planting and planning. The country was divided into 14 regions, with each region given its own list of suitable trees and shrubs. In Zone A, for instance, a strip of territory linking Benitsa, Kiev, Zhitomir, and Chernigov, um, workers were in, allowed to plant Siberian larch, pine, and birch. But in Zone B, a region just to the south, they were not, while currant and, uh, and white mulberry instead were sanctioned there, and not in Zone A. World War II nearly halted the afforestation work in the Soviet Union, but soon after the war's conclusion, the state renewed its dedication to protective afforestation with a rapid sequence of new legislation. In April 1947, GLO became, uh, was turned into the much more, more powerful Ministry of Forest Management, with a special bureau dedicated slow, solely to step afforestation. On 11th October 1947, the Council of Ministers approved an aggressive plan drafted by the Ministry of Forest Management to establish a million new acres of forest around the collective farms of southern Russia, and then six months later approved a, f a smaller version for the Ukraine. Together, these two plans, predicated on the premise that field protective belts of forest decrease the, wind, the speed of the wind across the fields, which in turn decreases the moisture transpired by crops and hence their desiccation, foresaw the establishment of more than 1.5 million hectares of new forest. But the grandiosity of the plans was offset by an unhurried pace, a limited scope, and a sober methodological approach. The work would start very slowly, with only one-sixth of the plantings conducted during the first three years, while the nurseries were being established. And planting instructions, featuring the species lists and charts that I mentioned earlier, were to be provided by the Ministry of Forest Management. The planting of the belts was to be performed only on freshly cleared ground, plowed to a depth of 25 to 27 centimeters just after the spring harrowing of the field stubble, and concluded in six to seven days. I mention these details not because they're interesting of themselves, but that these details existed and they were based on, um, on experimental trials and uh, experiments in general. And planting, furthermore, was forbidden on snow-covered or lightly plowed soil. And both plans, uh, the, uh, approved in 1947, ambitious though they were, shared relatively modest and scientifically grounded objectives to make landscapes more stable by making them more diverse, which would change the microclimates of the farms and the hydrology of relatively small spaces. Never mentioned in the 1947 plans was the changing of the climate of the country as a whole. It is at this point, sometime in late 1947, early 1948, that the plan changes for reasons that are still unfortunately not entirely clear. A drought in 1946 brought the worst grain harvest in over a century, and in its train, Ukrainian famine. The grain, the grain harvest of 1947 and 1948, while improvements over the disaster of 1946, nevertheless failed to match pre-revolutionary levels. To address the threat, a national conference of foresters, agricultural experts, and party leaders, but not Lysenko, convened in Saratov in February of 1948. And when that meeting failed to produce suitable proposals, a second conference in the southern city of Veliki Anadol was called for the summer of 1948. Transcripts of this conference have not been preserved, at least to my knowledge. But Deputy Minister of, uh, of Forest Management Koldanov later wrote that the Conference of Foresters marked the eve of a new era in steppe afforestation 
and that the materials of the conference were one of the basic sources for the preparation of a new decree, which later became the great selling plan for the transformation of nature. In this decree, the caution that had marked the Ministry of Forest Management's proposals in the 1930s and 1940s had little place. The programs of, 1940, of October for 1947 and April 1948 were expanded from 1.5 million hectares to 5.7 million hectares, but repurposed to a larger effort, that is, changing the climate of the country as a whole. Thus, for the first time in the Soviet afforestation effort, Prometheanism took center stage, although at the core of the plan still remained the dream of restoring the Russian landscape to an earlier state. Beneath the surface of the fantastic claims about the transformation of the climate, however, the influence of the technocrats working at the Ministry of Forest Management could still be discerned. Newsreels and newspaper articles emphasized the symbolic power of the mighty oak, but afforestation workers were ordered to use the old prepared list of species suited to each region. The decree included recommendations for suitable secondary trees and bushes, and foresters were instructed to observe the soil type when choosing species. The Ministry of Forest Management brought back into circulation a number of czarist-era works, long out of print for political associations in the 1920s and 1930s, um, and these works emphasized the ecology, the importance of the ecology of a plot scheduled for afforestation and urged workers to read these works. The decree of 20 October 1948, which was the great Sol the transformation of nature decree, was certainly a step in a radical Promethean direction, and yet in its first three months, the methodology of the plan, if not the aims, remained traditional. Now, obviously, this has just been backstory. This is where Lysenko enters the story, at least my story now. Uh, Lysenko's allies, tr allies tried to claim that it was Lysenko who first proposed the establishment of forest, uh, forests around farms to increase their yields. Um, but he was, as should be clear from the story I've just told, um, a latecomer to the effort. He's absent until uh, late 1948. Lysenko played no role whatsoever in the, in the development of the field protective afforestation plans of the 1930s and the 1940s and indeed had published, to my knowledge, any, nothing before 1948 about tree biology of itself, dendrology. However, the state's sudden interest in the practice drew his attention and prompted the articulation of a fantastic new theory of forestry, that trees could become collectivists. At the time of the Stalin plan's announcement, Lysenko told a reporter that he was then giving considerable thought to the planting of forests in nests, he said, and just a few months later, before experimental trials of the theory had been properly started, he began to declare this new scheme uh, the nest method, a complete success. Lysenko had determined that while members of different species did compete for resources, members of the same species actually helped one another. Lysenko, as most people in this room probably know, contended that all plants possessed a quality called self-thinning, which allows them to work together to fight against weeds in their early years, and then to pool their energy for the benefit of one shoot in the nest, the other shoots thereby sacrificing themselves for the main plant when the appropriate time comes. Thus, plants became soldiers in the fight for the survival of communism. Lysenko used his influence to place his, place his allies in key positions in, the new, in a new agency created to coordinate the planning work, which was called the Main Administration for Field Protective Afforestation, or GUPL, if you will. And the GUPL, in turn, capitalized on the confusion about the best way to implement the plan and lobbied the party's highest functionaries to adopt the Nest Method, which required no follow-up attention after planting the seeds. Responding favorably to such entreaties, the Council of Ministers in, uh, in August of 1949, citing positive experimentation with the Nest Method, decreed the universal application of the Nest Method elaborated by academician Lysenko. Although it had been tested for only 12 months, less than 12 months, on plants that live for hundreds of years, Lysenko's method became the obligatory way to create not only oak forests throughout the Soviet Union beginning in 1950, but for pine forests as well, about which he never sp said anything. Lysenko's capture of the GUPL and his victory on the 9th of August 1949 opened a schism in Soviet forest management with the party and the GUPL on one side and the Ministry of Forest Management, which, which had an established, and, uh, uh, established constituency on the other. Although they at first made a show of endorsing the Ness method, the leaders of the Ministry of Forest Management and the Academy of Sciences Institute of Forest deeply resented Lysenko's intrusion into their affairs and his reckless attitude toward their hopes of a proper, scientifically grounded ecological management. And soon they fought back. They fought resourceful and they proved resourceful and formidable critics of Lysenko, and they were unafraid to appeal directly to Stalin himself or any other member of the high command, and willing to interact directly with workers in the field to limit the influence of Lysenko's Prometheanism, although ultimately their protests led not to the reform but the abandonment of the program. In the autumn of 1949, the deputy of minister of, of uh, 
deputy minister of the Ministry of Forest Management, wrote directly to Stalin to complain about the mandated application of Lysenko's scheme. I quote, It would be premature to assert that Lysenko's method of planting forests is irreproachable. If, in the spring of 1950, the Ness method of cultivating forests is applied everywhere, we will be unable to use two million seedlings prepared for this year's use. Therefore, the Ministry of Forest Management would consider it proper to remove the words, the universal transition to the Ness method from the latest decree about the spring 1950 plantings. A letter sent by the same minister to um, Georgi Malenkov, ostensibly a less intimidating figure, uh, stated the objections even less cautiously. I quote, regardless of the fact that Lysenko's proposal has been already ratified by the GUPL, and therefore my objections have no practical significance, I nevertheless consider it necessary to express my disagreement with his scheme. What serves as the basis for his ideas? Nothing in the relevant literature, nor any practice, have promoted such schemes. Koldanov pitched his crit critiques of Lysenko at a theoretical level and did not need comprehensive experimental trials to know that the Ness method was doomed to failure. But beginning in 1950, they received copious evidence to this effect nonetheless. The Ministry of Forest Management began to hold conferences beginning in 1950 to gauge the su success of its work, and specifically the Ness method, which had been employed for three years and, thus and could thus be evaluated. There was little use in denying that Lysenko's methods did not produce belts that protected themselves, but rather belts that required enormous amounts of additional work. Originally, uh, Lysenko um, offered the idea that if trees were, if seeds were planted in a proper way, then they would protect themselves and would need no, need no additional care in subsequent years. But that proved false. Uh, it turned out that, uh, that the trees needed to be thinned even more so than, they, uh, than, they, uh, than the trees planted in traditional ways. Um, and Lysenko's allies in GUPL managed to fend off these critiques as the evidence rolled in. It was only after the 1952 planting, after another year of dismal returns, that the Ness method was finally nudged aside. GUPL's internal reports offered increasingly distressing, distressing statistics. Internal numbers indicated that fully half of the Ness method forests had died, and two of the large state belts were near total losses. Koldanov used these GUPL reports, as well as his own, his own data, to compose a letter to Georgi Malenkov in February of 1952, condemning almost every aspect of Lysenko's management. A few weeks later, on, uh, in, on the 25th of March 1952, Koldanov received the answer he had petitioned for. The Council of Ministers agreed that the application of a formulaic method of creating protective stands was inexpedient and accepted the necessity of a different, of a different technique for the creation of new forests, depending on local conditions. What followed was a brief period of uh, enthusiastic activity. The Ministry of Forest Management responded to this new decree by excitedly revising its plans in preparation for the 1953 planting season. Planting season, I should say. Uh, on March 5, 1953, the deputy head of the Ministry of Forest Management proudly announced that beginning this spring, the sowing of oak without the simultaneous planting of an appropriate secondary species will be forbidden, and the plantation types devised by GLO but shelved since 1949 would be resurrected. The experience of the past four years, comrades, has taught us much, said the head of the Saratov at Territorial Administration, uh, and the, days of the, glo the gloomy days of the past are behind us, but that night Stalin died. And on March 15th, six days after Stalin's funeral, the Ministry of Forest Management was liquidated. With the, with the functions of the Ministry of Forest Management transferred to the, to the Ministry of Agriculture, all forest-related programs fell into deep decline. The number of workers assigned to forest matters in Moscow fell from 927 to 342 in the space of six months, a 62% drop, and then to 120 after a year. From the regional administrations, 701 out of 1,400, 1400 workers were let go. Koldanov sent a series of alternatively angry and despairing letters to Khrushchev, asking about why the state had chosen to forsake forest management, but to no avail. Khrushchev and Beria threw their hands up when confronted by the repair costs looming to the old Ness method-based uh, stands, and they issued a joint decree in the spring of 1953 eliminating the, the main administration for field protective afforestation. After that, the great, the great Stalin plan receded rapidly from the public eye. Thank you very much. <laughs>